party aboard ship was in full swing. Speeches were being made by the captain, the crew, and the guests enjoying the week-long voyage. Sitting at the head table was a 70-year-old man who, somewhat embarrassed, was doing his best to accept the praise being poured on him. Earlier that morning, a young woman had apparently fallen overboard, and within seconds, this elderly gentleman was in the cold, dark waters at her side. The woman was rescued, and the elderly man became an instant hero. When time finally came for the brave passenger to speak, the stateroom fell into a hush as he rose from his chair. He went to the microphone and in what was probably the shortest hero speech ever offered, spoke these stirring words. I just want to know one thing. Who pushed me? <laughs> Today we'll talk a little bit about boldness and courage. And uh, I thought that that was an interesting uh, story to read. Who pushed me? Well, good morning, and uh, I am not Pastor Bill. He is uh, out today. Um, he's out visiting his uh, dad and celebrating um, a birthday with him. They have the same birthday, I believe. And uh, I'll have to keep looking at Debbie to she nods her head. That means I'm saying it correctly, so that's good. Uh, but anyway, so pray for him. I assume he landed and safely arrived. Or no, he's leaving. He's leaving. That's what's happening today. So, but anyway, I thank you for coming and. Um, Today we're going to talk a little bit about something that I was, uh, and I've been dwelling on for the past two weeks. I didn't know that pastor was going to ask me to, to speak, but it was actually kind of perfect timing because it was fresh in my head. So um, if you can open your Bibles to Esther, chapter number five, verse two, and maybe have your fingers on one hand on there. Now see, this is something that the iPad can't do, is to now open up your Bibles to Hebrews 4.16 at the exact same time. Put your finger in there, but I think you can do the uh, favorites or something like that, maybe uh, hold those two passages together. But I'm going to start by reading Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2. I'm sorry, Esther chapter 5, verse 2. All right, Esther 5, 2 says, It happened when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. And then Hebrews 4.16, uh, and I'm going to actually start with uh, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Other versions said, let us, draw, let us go boldly into the throne of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for today. I pray that, the uh, again, the words of my mouth and uh, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the Bible continues to amaze me. Um, you know, I've been uh, saved since 1975 and grew up in church probably beginning the third and fourth grade and, and uh, onward. And I've read the Bible. We've had challenges in youth, and we challenge our youth to do this um, all the time, that, like, especially during the summer, is to read the whole Bible through. And, uh, you know, if you've done that, um, it's easy to kind of go through it quickly. And then the second time, you say, well, I've already read it. But then the second time you go through it, you realize, wow, I'm learning something new. And then the third time and the fourth. And even today, as I'm reading, as I was uh, looking um, at the book of Esther and the story of Esther, even then, I was finding something new, something was just uh, revealed to me. And God continues to do that. His scripture is uh, fully inspired. Um, but as, you know, I'm going to do a shameless plug for Gordy's devotion today, a Sunday school lesson. But, you know, he was talking about looking at scripture and, and, and how we interpret scripture. I'm reminded of this verse in Psalm 119, 16 that says, I will delight myself in the statutes, in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. 
So most of you have probably known and have heard about the story of Queen Esther. Um, I know that even my girls, as we were growing up, I got them the VeggieTales version, right? The VeggieTales. Everyone loves the VeggieTales, right? How many don't know what VeggieTales is? I, oh, okay, there's a few of you out there. <laughs> it's, it's actually a great cartoon that follows through with the uh, stories, um, and they take biblical principles and, and put them into cartoon uh, format. It, it, it took me a couple of times to watch the VeggieTales to realize it was actually vegetables. And then I went, ah, hence veggie. Didn't, I didn't quite get that. I just, for some reason, I couldn't tell the cucumber and the squash and the tomato. But anyway, it was, it was, uh, it was really fun watching that with the kids. And they couldn't wait for the next Bible story to come out. But I had never really connected the idea of the story of Esther and that of eternal life in Christ. I mean, that was something that was kind of new and revealed so, uh, to me today. So today I want to share and reflect with you what I have been dwelling on on these past few days. So, many of you, again, know the story of Esther, but maybe you don't know a little bit about the book of Esther. So, before I talk about the story that's in this book, let me just give a little bit of historical background. And, and Gordy, again, kudos to you for t- t- uh, touching that on Sunday school. So, um, the book was written roughly about 486 to 465 B.C., and that's actually correct um, numbering system, right? Because as you get to zero, you count down. In contrast, the book of Daniel took place right around 605 B.C. to 530 B.C. So you see that the the book of Esther and the stories that are, um, uh, the history that's talked about that is after uh, Daniel. It was kind of getting close to that 400 years where uh, they call it a period of silence uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It all took place in the city of Susa which is in uh, Persia, city of Babylon, which we now know as modern uh, Iraq. There are several possible reasons why the book of Esther was written, um, one being the Feast of Purim, and that is actually a uh, celebration that the Jews have, uh, roughly about the fall, winter time. And uh, it is uh, one day for the Jews to avenge themselves of their enemies, um, and that was the reason for the feast. And then the next day they rested, hence the uh, Purim. So when, when and if you were to partake of that today, uh, some of the observances you would have when you're part of their uh, uh, feast is to read the book of Esther. They actually take the book of Esther and read that. They also give money, uh, gifts to the poor. They send gifts of food to friends. And then they have the feast afterwards, right? It is also one of the most controversial books to be included in the canon. So as you study scripture and how the Bible was put together, um, it was controversial. And one of the reasons is because you don't see the name God in it. You see God through it, but you don't see the actual word or the name of God in there. And so that was very controversial during that time as they were putting it together. But uh, the other part is that like Daniel, there's a lot of what they call maybe myths or stories that uh, developed during that time. And so there was, there was that controversy. But for me, I will leave these ongoing controversial books and uh, allow Gordy to take that to his class and uh, talk about the history and the culture and work all that through. Um, but I know that for me personally, God has divinely inspired every single word and uh, book in, his, in what we call today the Bible. So today I'm sharing uh, about the book of Esther and, and this particular passage about um, touching of the scepter. One, because I was uh, listening, and I think Josh Eater did, did this last Sunday, um, or maybe at some point, but there was, there's the songs, Boldly I Approach, uh, Boldly I Approach You, and I, I was, you know, constantly singing that um, on my on my iPhone as I was catching bars, as I was catching the ferries, going to work, and it drowns out the rest of the crowd that's going on um, as you're driving. But as I was listening to that, uh, I, get, I began to really think about the words of that song, and then, you know, boldly and thrown. And, you know, I mean, we don't have, like, this kingship going on here in, in the United States, but, you know, I was kind of thinking, well, uh, this is probably even, you know, when they have the celebration for Queen Elizabeth, I mean, 
imagine all that, you know, kind of meeting the queen and, and all the rules that go with that, the proper handshake or to not handshake, um, all the things that go along with that. Yet here in, in, in this idea of us as Christians boldly approaching God's throne, because we have the privilege of approaching God, knowing we have that confidence that we are his sons and daughters. And then the third thing is that this all took place because Jesus extended his gift of eternal life to us. That all we have to do is touch the scepter. And so I was kind of putting all that together and I came up with about three thoughts. And I'm sure that as, as you know, you read it, you'll, you'll have different thoughts. But these are the three that I'm going to share with you this morning. And so number one, as I look at the book of Esther and I, and I look at the life of Esther, the first thing I see is that Esther came as she was. So my first point is to come as you are. So Esther did not have, well, she had a father, father and mother, but they had died early in her life. She was reared by her cousin Mordecai. Uh, she was a Jew, and that may not be a big deal, except that the Jews at the time were controlled or were under Persian authority. And, uh, you know, political or not, uh, you know, this, the relationship with, with Cuba now having the better relationship with the U.S., I mean, there's, there's that feeling of independence. So there was oppression going on with the Jews under uh, Persians. She had no choice to join a beauty pageant. And you may think that, well, you know, that would be a no-brainer. If somebody asked me to join, I'd join. But maybe she didn't want to. But she had no choice. And then on top of all that, you know, her looks were not good enough. Even though the Bible says that she was beautiful to look on, the Persians didn't think so. So she had to go through 12 months of getting to look better. Um, I was going to have a, a little joke on wedding and stuff like that, but I think I'll pass on that for now. <laughs> it was really good in my mind earlier, but now nah, I'll pass on that. But let's just say that it took six months <laughs> for to get all the perfume going on her, and then it took another six months for the spices and cosmetics. And um, if you look through history and, and uh, you know, the TV and all that, they don't depict everything. You know, they exaggerate on a lot of things. But we do know that there was a lot of, you know, the Egyptian markings and the cosmetics that went with that. So the Persians were not all that different. Esther, um, as part of this uh, pageant, had no choice for the food that she ate. Now, remember, uh, Jews had certain things that they couldn't eat. But in this case, she was put into that kind of position. Now, whether she took the stand of Daniel, as you remember from the story of Daniel, maybe she heard about Daniel and took that stand. I don't know, but there, there's a verse uh, in Esther that, that talks a little bit about, uh, well, verse, verse 9 actually is uh, of Esther chapter 2, verse 9. It, it, it does say, Now the young lady, that's Esther, pleased him, and that was um, one of, the, uh, one of his, uh, her caretakers, and found favor with him, so he quickly provided her with cosmetics and food and gave her seven choices made from the king's palace and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. So we can maybe allude to the fact that Esther took a stand as well and said, I can't do this, I can't eat of this thing because she purposed in her heart. I don't know. But we do know that she was not offered the, the choice of food. And as the story goes on, she eventually became queen. Again, a choice that she did not choose. It was, everything was just in pattern. But what I, as I was dwelling on this, I just kind of thought, wow. Yeah, maybe somebody would have taken David and said, okay, you now need to be the president. And I had like no choices all along the way. And whether I like to or not, and, that, and whether you think that, oh, that's a great thing to be as the president, that still doesn't take into account the fact that I didn't have a choice for that. And I was thinking of how Esther may have felt. And it just dawned on me at that, that Esther was obedient regardless of her standing in society. 
because she was obedient and allowed God to move through her life, she was coming as she was. And I, and I thought that was really good. And, and Jesus wants you and I to come as we are. Regardless of our looks, regardless of our position in society, whether we're rich, we're poor, uh, whether we're educated or not, we need to come with our worries and sickness and burdens. Don't, you know, sometimes I do hear, well, you know, Christianity is good for you because, um, you know, you're, you're good, you're clean, you're speaking clean, you don't do anything wrong. But for me, I've been bad all my life. I've done things that are wrong. You know, Jesus can't possibly like me. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, come as you are. Come with your baggage. Come with everything that weighs you down. And I will, uh, as I was sharing what I was going to talk about today with a friend, he said, and by the way, uh, come because you just can't fake Jesus out. You can't pretend. He knows your thoughts. He knows who you are. Just come. All Christ requires of us to receive is his wonderful gift of salvation, is to come as we are. Leave our worries behind. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, "Come unto me, all ye that are all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest." So, then the second thought I was reflecting on as I was looking at this uh, life of Esther is that she came with confidence. We are to come to Jesus with confidence. So, even though the book of Esther does not mention anything about God. We know and we can see God through Esther herself. We can see through Mordecai, her cousin, and how that upbringing took place. We can see that God working through Mordecai. We see that even though there was political issues between the Persians and the Jews, that God was still in charge of the bigger picture. It's like we can't control, we may think that we have like, you know, we vote, we can control this. We can control that. But in reality, God is in control. God is dictating how our country is. God dictates what he wants to happen. It's all part of his plan. So here we have Esther, who doesn't come from all these, you know, high society and all that stuff. But she's coming to this task, to this really queen-like task, with confidence and boldness as she approaches the king. As I was reflecting on that, I was thinking, well, what made her bold? Like, what makes me bold? What makes believers bold? And then the verses that came through after that in, in those first few chapters of Esther, it finds she had that, uh, that cousin Mordecai who was on her side. She had someone to go to. And I liken that to this church. You know, um, again, often you hear, well, we don't, I don't need to come to church. I can just watch TV, watch a sermon, or I can do something else. I can read the Bible on my own. That's all great. I mean, that's that personal relationship that you're establishing with God. But as I always share with the, the youth and the guys that I hang around with here in this church is I love to come to church. Why? Because there's that fellowship. I know they have my back, Right? Uh, even right before I came here, Gordy put his hand and said, you got it, you got it. You know, like, okay, he's got my back. So I'll just give him my notes and he can continue. <laughs> but really, that's what church is about. That's what this body of believers is about. The church, the building, this doesn't come with me when I go home. But the people do. So Esther was bold because she had Mordecai, her cousin. And I would like to say that I have my brothers and sisters in Christ to proceed to that throne. The other thing that I see is that there was a lot of prayer and fasting. And um, I know that George Wright, who's not here today, he's always emphasizing when we talk, he's like, prayer is important. Prayer is important. And Connell loves to say that too. Prayer is important. Yes, it is. And that allows us to have that boldness to go forward. Trust me, I needed a lot of prayer this morning. It was good, and it feels good to know that 
there's someone there to pray for me. Uh, the fasting part is interesting. I grew up in a very um, sort of strict, a very strict church. And uh, one time we were new Christians. My parents were new Christians. And again, I was like third grade, fourth grade. And the pastor came and he preached a sermon on fasting. And then he challenged the congregation to fast. And I couldn't remember all the details. And I didn't really think much of it. I'm only in second, third grade, so what's fasting? Go fast? <laughs> like, go fast, not slow. Um, so I didn't know. I didn't really understand that. So we get home, and, and my dad says, starting at 6 p.m., <laughs> we're going to fast. I'm like, like a race? Like, and he said, no, no, we're not going to eat. Like, what? Whoa, where did that come from? You know, we're like wanting to raise our hands like we're in school. Uh, question. <laughs> and he's, he mentioned how pastor cha challenged us to, to challenge the church to fast, and he felt like the Lord leading him to do that, and so he wanted us all to participate. So then, um, I don't know, we thought maybe, okay, it's cool, that, that'll be something like we can last for 24 hours. I mean, it was only a 24 hours of, uh, fast that he wanted us to do, so... We thought, okay, well, if we if we really just eat a lot at five, five thirty, we go to sleep, wake up by eight o'clock. Oh, that's at least what twelve or three, fifteen hours, just a few more hours to go. But I remember my brother, and and you know he was the most dramatic of one. Somewhere after waking up, he went in and he forgot that it was supposed to fast, and he started to go to the refrigerator, and my dad heard it and he said, hey, I'm late. What are you doing? He goes, I'm just getting some milk for my cereal. <laughs> and my dad said, no, remember, we're supposed to be fasting. He's like, oh, oh. And then later on, an hour later, he just flopped on the floor. <laughs> He's like, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm dying. I don't know, fasting and me, we just, in our family, that was just something that we told our dad, oh, what made you, and then we, couldn't wait to tell the pastor the next, you know, when, when I was a little bit older, how, you know, pastor, sometimes you need to not, like, explain a little bit to your congregation that fasting is for adults. <laughs> kids, don't include the kids. But, you know, this is what Esther had. Esther had this going. She had prayer and fasting. And, you know, the point of fasting is to block out everything that could distract us and really put our focus on God or the prayer request at hand. And what Esther was about to do, which was enter the throne of the king without permission that could cost her her life, it was very important that she would pray and fast. And that Mordecai would pray and fast. And then, and later on in those verses, you find out that there were others that she had asked to pray and fast. Another reason why Esther was able to move and go boldly to this king was because God made a way. I told you before, God's in charge. And he can control even those who don't think there is a God. So I'm looking at the guy named Haggai. Well, this is the guy that liked Esther. I would say he's a Persian who was following rules, but he liked Esther. He saw, he saw something in her that was different. Shazgaz like that name, liked her. He was like the next in line before she was being presented to the, for queenship. And he liked her. You know, so there's people that are not even, that are from the outside, that don't know about the God of uh, Esther, that God was working in their lives. And then we find in verse uh, 17 that at some point, King Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, loved her and chose her to be queen. Well, all these things were taking place because it was preparing her to boldly go where most Persians, not with all Persians, much, much less the Jews, would go, and that is to approach the king. So the key thought I got from that was that God provides, God provides, 
the boldness, the courage, and confidence when we give up ourselves to him. That him I surrender all, all to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain. He, Jesus, washed it white as snow. And in Matthew 5.16, for us as believers, let our light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Come with boldness, come with confidence, give yourselves to Jesus. Then the last thought that I reflected on, and again, there's many more if you read the book of Esther, it's just such a beautiful book, was that to come and touch. Esther's first goal was to be obedient. Esther's second goal was to go, to go with confidence. Esther's next goal was to touch, to touch the scepter that was going to be offered, that she was praying and fasting would be offered to her. See, in order for Esther to finally make connection or communicate with the king, Xerxes, the king had to offer the scepter. And it wasn't just the offering of that scepter, but it was for Esther to touch it, to acknowledge. To acknowledge that she now had the freedom to speak her mind. She had to touch the scepter. Her whole life depended on that. So up to that point, Esther, queen, was now defying all Persian laws about entry. Up to that point, she would, she gave up everything she had. Because you can't just again walk to the king and decide you want to talk to him. Her life was at stake. And now what she had to do was touch the scepter. I kind of thought that and said, you know, for us, life eternal is already given to us. But we need to reach out and touch Jesus. He is the only one that can reverse our life course. Are you interested in doing that today? Would you like to reach out and touch our Savior? We will have a different reflection time this morning in our reflection. Um, I'm going to call that our reflection time will be not an end, but the start of communion. We will be serving communion today. So I'm going to now ask the deacons to come forward at this time. But as they are coming forward, I want to extend an invitation for salvation. Before you can partake in communion, you must know Christ as your personal Savior. And I want to give you that opportunity to join us as we partake in that. So if you've come here today and want to know more about this beautiful gift of salvation, you want to touch that scepter, that life eternal that God has given to us, I'm going to ask, and I'm going to ask you to right now stand, and I'm going to ask that you come and pray with any of these young men. And if you don't feel comfortable and you want to talk to a woman, we have those available to meet with you and to pray with you. So I ask you to come. And then for those of you who are believers in Christ, I wanted you to reflect on a few more things. I've had a lot of time to reflect, so I'll get to pass this on to you. Esther did not have many choices, but the few choices she had, she took full advantage for them, for such a time as that. And in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, I'm going to paraphrase it, Mordecai challenges Esther to speak up, her her people were going to be uh, killed, Uh, there was enemy in the camp, that's why she needed to go speak to the king. And Mordecai says that uh, in the last part of verse 14, says, and who knows that what you do today? And who knoweth whether you are come to this kingdom for such a time as this? See, every believer has a purpose, a special purpose. 
How are you called to serve Jesus through your life here on earth? And here at North Hills for such a time as this. Pastor Bill always reminds us that we need to reach the Joshua or unchurched generation. So how is North Hills called to be part of that challenge? And where do you fit in as believers for such a time as this? I can't really fathom to know what Esther felt as the doors opened as she walked to go make her petition to the king. It must be humanly frightening knowing that she's giving up her whole life. But I think we can take comfort in knowing that Esther left her comfort zone to be a part of something greater and eternal for the Jews. And the question to you today is, when, as believers, will you leave your comfort zone and be part of something greater and more eternal for Christ? I'd like to repeat and read Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Verse 16 says, Therefore let us draw near or come boldly with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Come. The aisles are open. We've got men to pray with you. Jesus has extended the scepter. Won't you reach out and touch?